Good morning. Uh, lovely to see you all, and it's so wonderful to be back in our church for the second Sunday. And uh, we hope we are now back permanently. We all keep our fingers crossed that that is going to be the way things are from, from now on. And uh, especially that so many people have been vaccinated um, and it's just increasing, increasing, and it's amazing to see the rollout of the vaccination. And it's so wonderful in getting us all back into church and back into community at large and back doing all the things we love and meeting all the people we love. So once again, it's wonderful to see you all gathered here today. <clears throat> this morning, we dedicate our candle lighting to the memory of His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip. And we as a community express our sincere condolences to Her Majesty, uh, to his children, his grandchildren, and indeed his great-grandchildren. Prince Philip should be remembered as first and foremost a loving husband, a grandfather, great-grandfather, and a dedicated consort to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. He was, of course, quite a character in his own right. And I understand he has designed the Land Rover, which will uh, carry his coffin next Saturday. And he sometimes expressed himself in ways that were indeed humorous and candid and blunt. I watched a little video of him uh, when he was addressing the Press Association in Washington. And he said that it was the first time he visited America. And it was during, it had, during the uh, presidency, not long after the war, when Winston Churchill had been returned as prime minister uh, after the Labour government, I hastily point out in the 50s. And when they were at a reception, an American lady approached the Queen and acknowledged her and said to her, and this is, by the way, Prince Charles's story. He said when the lady approached the Queen, acknowledged Her Majesty and said, um, I'm so glad to see your father is back in as Prime Minister meeting Winston Churchill. And somebody leaned forward and said, no, no, Winston Churchill is not Her Majesty's father. So she turned and apologized to Prince Philip, said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm so glad to see your father back in as Prime Minister. The Irish President, Michael D. Higgins, recalled the Queen's visit to Dublin and the wonderful welcome he received as president on the, his first, on the first official visit of any Irish president to Windsor Castle. And he remembered with great love and affection, as he stated, their visit to Dublin and how he enjoyed the company of the Queen and Prince Philip. And he remembered when he attended the visit to, in Windsor how he was greeted warmly by the Queen and again enjoyed the wonderful company of Prince Philip. We should also remember his great contribution during the war and was a noted war hero. And then, of course, the many initiatives he took afterwards during his service, in particular the Duke of Edinburgh Award. And many of us would have observed people appearing on the television over the last couple of days, talking endlessly about taking part in the Duke of Edinburgh Award. His view was, 
If a young lad's out throwing stones or breaking windows, it would be better to get him involved in something like this. And I watched many young men talking about how the Duke of Edinburgh Ward had saved them, in many cases, from a life, a life of possibly even crime. And we know how the Duke of Edinburgh Ward worked in conjunction and in cooperation with Gashka, the President's Ward, which was set up by the then Irish President, Mary McAleese. And the two worked very closely together, and still do to this day, on Gashka and the Duke of Edinburgh Award. There is a saying in Irish, Nive Gilehaid Arishan, we shall not see his like again. I think in the case of Prince Philip, that is definitely true. And may I add, Eryashite Gorev Anam Delish, may his holy soul be on the right side of God. Farewell, sir. You've earned your rest. Rest in peace. Now light the candle in his memory. Spirit of life, we pray for healing. Spirit of life, we pray for the healers. Spirit of life, we pray for closeness in our hearts. Amen. Our first reading this morning, as a mark of respect to the Duke of Edinburgh, is the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell and the house of the Lord forever. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. Some of you may not know me. My name is Linda Kane, and I'm a member of All Souls and also currently a student in training for our ministry in the non-subscribing Presbyterian Church of Ireland. <clears throat> Last night, I found myself late on doing an assignment because who does these things on time? And uh, part of that assignment was to, in a fashion, critique someone else's service in terms of how I would present it in all souls, where I'm supposed to have been doing my placement, which has been significantly impacted by COVID. But one of the things I did was to change one of the readings. The theme of the service was repentance and forgiveness. And there were two readings from scripture. And I thought if I was doing that service, I'd add in a poem because I always love to add in a poem. And in all souls, we accept that as a form of divine inspiration, the same as scripture. And so I thought I'd share it with you. And it is, of course, by my favorite spiritual poet, John O'Donohue. And the poem is called, For Someone Who Did You Wrong. Though its way is to strike in a dumb rhythm, stroke upon stroke, as though the heart were an anvil, the hurt you sent had a mind of its own. Something in you knew exactly how to shape it, to hit the target, slipping into the heart through some wound window left open since childhood. While it struck outside, it burrowed inside, made tunnels through every ground of confidence. For days, it would lie still until a thought would start it. Meanwhile, you forgot, went on with things and never even knew how that perfect shape of hurt still continued to work. Now, a new kindness seems to have entered time and I can see how that hurt has schooled my heart in a compassion I would otherwise have never learned. Somehow now, I have begun to glimpse the unexpected fruit your dark gift had planted, and I thank you for your unknown work. The collection of nations and islands that we live in, these islands, mostly known as the United Kingdom and, of course, the Republic of Ireland. But in this United Kingdom, there are multiples of identities and, indeed, languages, many what would be perceived to be indigenous languages that are recognized officially, such as Scots Gaelic, Irish Gaelic, Welsh, now Manx, which is spoken by a couple of hundred people on the Isle of Man. Cornish, there are now some fluent Cornish speakers. And as I discovered on the island of Jersey, Jersey, which is a mixture of French and English. And then there's all the other languages that have arrived here with numerous people from around the world. I think after English, I may be wrong, but I think Polish is probably the second most spoken language in the UK. Possibly Chinese, but I think it's Polish. 
but equally there is Chinese, Urdu and Hindu and many, many more in communities in all the great cities that people live in. And all bound together, all bound together with various workings of the English language. I say various workings of the English language because although we all believe we speak the same language, sometimes I'm not always sure. Even after 15 years living in Belfast, I struggle to know what's being said to me, or more importantly, the meaning of what's being said to me. And if I can explain it in this way, if you ask if you go to Cork, how does a Cork man say no? He says, I will, yeah. Now, I don't know if there's such an idiom here in Belfast, but I'm sure there is. And as I said, we're all linked together in so many ways. There are 6.7 million people in England who are of Irish origin, or who are Irish. 6.7 million people in England alone. I always point out these three facts sometimes to people who follow sport like myself. When England was playing in the World Cup and their captain was Harry Kane, Harry Kane's family hail from the west of Ireland, from an Irish-speaking island, and his grandfather was an Irish speaker. So Harry Kane could have either captained the English football team or indeed the Irish football team. And then you have Owen Farrell, whose father, Andy Farrell, is the manager or trainer or coach of the Irish rugby team and also hails from a family of Irish extraction. Owen could, in actual fact, Owen Farrell could play rugby for England or Ireland. And last but not least, when England won the World Cup in cricket, no less than Owen Morgan. Now, Owen Morgan is not of Irish extraction. Owen Morgan is from Dublin, from Balbriggan, and played cricket in that neighbourhood, of which many people wouldn't be aware. But in North County Dublin, in places like Balbriggan, cricket is a working class game in that part of Dublin, a working class game. And Owen Morgan would have learned cricket in that neighbourhood where it's played with great passion. And last but most certainly not least, Rachel Blackmore. Let's hear it for Rachel Blackmore. An Irish woman and the first woman ever to win the Grand National. What an amazing person she is. And sadly, the Grand National didn't have the thousands of people there this year that could have celebrated with Rachel. But I'm sure the celebrations regarding Rachel's great win uh, will go on for some time yet. Now, equally amongst these islands, some may wish to go their separate ways. But however, even having said that, it's still a unique and pluralist society throughout these islands. Pluralist in the real sense that it embraces cultures and differences. And some of the institutions may puzzle an outsider. And I mean by that the monarchy and the affection and warmth 
that many, many people have for the monarchy, whereas some others may not. And that does, it does puzzle people from outside looking in. The strong affection for Her Majesty the Queen in particular. And how that works along as a constitutional monarch with one of the oldest democratic parliaments in the world. Not always the best behaved parliament in the world, but still one of the oldest. I say one of the oldest because it's challenged by the Isle of Man and it's challenged by Iceland as to whether which is actually the oldest. I kind of go with the Isle of Man. Today, the Westminster Parliament is most likely the most diverse parliament in Europe, both ethnically and openly gay. There are 45 openly gay members of the Westminster Parliament. And this is in Europe where there are still some countries where there's absolutely no way a member of parliament would openly admit to being gay. 45 openly gay. I believe it is the most ethnically diverse parliament in Europe. And this is not just me deciding on this. This is according to Nina Gill. Nina Gill is a, an ex Labour MEP. She was an MEP up, into, up until Brexit happened and the UK MEPs had to leave the European Parliament. Nina says, whilst she was a member of the European Parliament and coming from Asian extraction, there were 12, 12 ethnic minority MEPs in the whole of the European Parliament, 12. And when the UK left, there were six. So six of the 12 were actually MEPs from the United Kingdom. Now, even still to this day, ethnic minorities are still not truly represented as yet in the British Parliament. There is a way to go as yet. More, and also, of course, there is a way to go until there's true representation of women in the British Parliament. And may I add to that, as someone who is a trade union leader for 20 years, the one thing that worries me is that even with the Labour Party, most of them are people who are coming straight into, from university into working for politicians and in as MEPs, MPs. So there is now a falling dramatic number in working class people in the British Parliament. But however, we can celebrate that in an ethnically pluralist society that the United Kingdom has the most ethnically diverse parliament in Europe. I understand there are probably more people from ethnic minorities in the Westminster Parliament than there are in all the <coughs> other European parliaments put together. And we have continuously seen new people arrive from all parts of the world, not only to GB, but here to Northern Ireland as well. Some for a better life, others because they are fleeing oppression, they are fleeing conflict, fleeing war, and they come here for comfort, for sanctuary, for a new life or indeed they're fleeing discrimination on grounds of religion, grounds of race, grounds of sexual orientation. 
and we continue to the greater extent to welcome strangers to our land and into our communities. Within the New Testament, which Christians read in continuity with the Hebrew Bible of the Old Testament, the most often cited passage dealing with welcoming the stranger is from Matthew 25, 31 to 40. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Those words resonate with us today. But how had Matthew described the strangers? Well, throughout biblical texts, the term stranger refers to people who stood outside the dominant social and religious norms. To some extent, non-subscribing Presbyterians and Unitarians for hundreds of years. People who practiced other religions which were frowned upon. People who came from different nations or who, because they were different in other ways, they came here because they were persecuted, looking for sanctuary. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For, for you all are one in Christ Jesus. These are the words from Galatians 3.28. Now, some might want to interpret those words in a narrow, creedal way. That if you want to be one in the name of Jesus Christ, you must subscribe to a particular narrow, creedal doctrine. We don't do that here. I like to think of those words as not only poetic and literature, but a call to embrace the other, a call to oneness in acceptance of the other, and the growing of a truly inclusive community. The celebration of baptism is the wel welcoming of a new member into the family of God, and in our case, into this family the family of all souls. Just as with birth, this is an occasion of great joy for the members of the church, as well as the person who has been baptized. In this church, baptism is seen as a sign of hope, a sign of a free spirit, a free thinking person and of inclusive love, embraced in the oneness of this community. Today we welcome four new people in baptism, one as part of our service now, and later three in private baptism for particular reasons. So I ask Hadija to please come forward. And Linda. Before we start the baptism service, I just want to point out, this is All Souls Baptismal Record. 
I think it's twice as old, if not more, than this building. And the first baptism is recorded in, bear with me, in 1829. The first baptism is recorded. Now the one thing you do notice in this record is the beautiful writing in 1829. But then when you get to the present, you notice a decidedly disintegration of handwriting. And I'm sure anthropologists in the future will, will actually study that to see was this mankind in reverse, but that is an incredible book, and Khadija, your name will go in that book, recorded in, as baptism here. And each person that's baptized gets a baptismal certificate. Linda. This is a service of thanksgiving, of recognition, and indeed of welcome. We thank God for the gift of this woman and for all the divine possibilities in each person. We believe that all who are born into this world are children of God and therefore in some measure share his spirit. We recognize their membership of the human family and welcome them into the fellowship of our faith trusting that in it they may ever find inspiration and love and joy and the peace that passes understanding. We pray that they may prove worthy of their origin and heritage and be faithful to all the tasks of life they are called to fulfil. Hadija, you have undertaken a serious and solemn responsibility which may sometimes cause anxiety or demand sacrifices, but also bring the deepest joy. With baptism, you undertake responsibilities with sensitivity and care, that you may be an example to others and a help in times of trouble. As the love of God, is unconditional, so must your love be also. We use the ancient symbol of water as a sign of our common heritage. Essential to existence, water reminds us of our common bond. Water comes from the ground and is the source of life. As water quenches our thirst, so may it symbolize the water of life abundant for which people have thirsted throughout all the ages. And as is the tradition in all souls, I pour in some water from the River Jordan. What name have you chosen for yourself? Hadija Mayanga, I baptize you with water as a symbol of the common life which is in all and in the world about you. We welcome you to the community of life on earth and dedicate you to everything which is beautiful and truthful and good. May your body be blessed. 
May you realize that your body is a beautiful friend of your soul. May you also have peace. May you also have joy in hearing, in seeing, in touching. May your senses always enable you to celebrate the universe. May your senses be awakened to the glories and beauties of life. And may you be sensitive to its suffering. Let us pray. We remember the welcome and the blessing which Jesus gave to those children of his brought to him at Galilee. And we know that you will each welcome Harijah to this, our beloved community in all souls. May her life be long and filled with the joy of God's creation. And Harijah, may you be surrounded by that divine love which can hold firm when all around seems shaken. And now let the peace and the love of Jesus be known within your home. And may you be enriched by your faith and sustained by your knowledge of God's inclusive love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Will you please welcome Hadija into our
be ours a religion which like sunshine goes everywhere, its temple of space, its shrine the good heart, its creed all truth, its ritual works of love, its profession of faith divine living. Amen. God bless you all. Go in peace.